Hi there, everyone, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. It's December 22nd. Today, we celebrate the botanist and doctor who established the country's first public botanical garden, and we'll also learn about an English Victorian author who loved roses. We'll recognize the inspiring former president and owner of Tulsa Greenhouse and Four State Wholesale. And we'll hear an excerpt about pruning from a peach farmer. We'll grow that garden library today with a book from American Garden Royalty. It's part garden book and part cookbook. And then we'll wrap things up with the story about the only first lady recognized by the American Horticultural Society with their highest honor, the Liberty Hyde Bailey Award. And it was well-deserved. But first, I just wanted to take a second to tell you about the Daily Gardener Friday newsletter. Each and every Friday, even when the show is on break, subscribers to the newsletter get an exclusive email from me with some super useful content, including helpful reminders and tips for the week to help you grow as a gardener. I also include a handy list for you that features all of the books from the Grow That Garden Library that were mentioned on the show the past week. So that's all right there for you. And then I provide a brand new botanist profile along with two pieces of botanical poetry that have not been shared on the show. And you'll also get plenty of garden-inspired recipes, gifts, and hacks. I love all of that. And finally, I like to make the newsletter a little more personal. So you'll see photos and stories about my own home and garden, in addition to exclusive updates about the show. I think of it as a little behind-the-scenes VIP experience for super fans of the podcast. And don't forget that each week, one lucky subscriber will be chosen as a winner for a lovely gardening book from the Grow That Garden Library bookshelf. And I like to say, if you enjoy the podcast, you're going to love the newsletter. So head on over to the dailygardener.org and sign up for the free Friday newsletter today. Here's today's curated garden news. Today's article is from the World Economic Forum, and it was written by Gregory Moore. It had a great title, and it's called Tree Ferns Are Older Than Dinosaurs. And that's not even the most interesting thing about them. Well, when Gregory wrote this piece, he was speaking specifically about the tree ferns in Australia. And what I found fascinating is his distinction between tree ferns and trees, because tree ferns are not really trees. And here's what the article said. First of all, tree ferns are ferns. They're not really trees. To be a tree... A plant must be woody, which means it's undergoing secondary plant growth, which thickens stems and roots. And it also must grow to a height of at least three meters when mature. And while tree ferns can have a single thick trunk-like stem and grow to a height of more than 15 meters, they're never woody, which is why they are not considered trees. Tree ferns are some of the oldest plants on the planet, and like many other ferns, they unfurl a beautiful, vibrant green fiddlehead when they start growing. And one of their most spectacular features is their ability to come back after a bushfire. Greg writes, they're incredibly hardy, and tree ferns are the first plants to show signs of recovery in the early weeks after bushfires. There's a lot to unpack in this article, and it's fascinating to learn about these ancient plants that existed on Earth long before our flowering or cone-bearing plants that we love so much. 
These guys have been a significant part of the Earth's flora. And remember, they reproduce by spores. Now, if you'd like to check out this post, you can do that very easily in the free Facebook group for the show, the Daily Gardener Community. Once you're there, all you need to do is type in the word fern and today's post will pop right up. And I share all of my curated news articles and original blog posts there so that it's easy for you to track things down. You'll never need to take notes or search for links. All you need to do is the next time you're on Facebook, just search for Daily Gardener Community, where you'd search for a friend and request to join. I'd love to meet you in the group. Here's today's brevities. Today is the anniversary of the death of the doctor and botanist David Hosick, who died on this day, December 22nd in 1835. He was 65 years old. In 2018, David Hosick's story was brilliantly told in the biography by Victoria Johnson, and the book is called American Eden, and I've put a link to it in today's show notes. David was a New Yorker, and he was a leading doctor in America during the early days of the country. David had a fantastic gift. He was able to form incredible relationships with the leading thinkers of his time. Dr. Benjamin Rush was his mentor, and England's top botanist, William Curtis, trained him in botany and medicinal plants. At the age of 25, David returned to his alma mater, Columbia University, where he taught medicine and botany. David's patients included Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton. And if you've watched the musical, you know that although David was one of the best physicians available, he could not save Hamilton. David Hosick established the country's first public botanical garden, and he put it right in the middle of Manhattan. David initially focused on medicinal plants, but he soon added vegetables, grasses, grains, and fruits, and also exotics collected from all over the world. It really was a paradise. David's medical students used his gardens as an extension of their classroom, and that was a first for people on this side of the Atlantic. At its zenith, David's garden boasted of having over 2,000 different species of plants. Just incredible. And it was David's pioneering work with plants that allowed him to teach an entire generation of doctors brand new remedies to common medical problems. Now, unfortunately, David's vision for the garden way exceeded his financial ability to keep it going. Sadly, David was forced to sell off and dismantle his botanical dream. And today, his former garden is the site of Rockefeller Center. Yet David's garden and his work had inspired botanists all over the world. And although his botanic garden didn't survive, David's dream of a garden of discovery and learning would be carried out through the work of other pioneers like Henry Shaw, Charles Sprague Sargent, and David Fairchild. In the twilight of his life, David's wife died. After remarrying a very wealthy woman, David built a country estate with an incredible garden, of course, and that is where he enjoyed his remaining days on this earth. And today is the 140th anniversary of the death of the English Victorian author George Eliot, who died on this day, December 22nd in 1880. George Eliot was the pen name for a woman 
named Marianne Evans, and her many works like Silas Marner and Middlemarch are packed with images from the garden. To Marianne, plants were the perfect representation of faith. Like faith, our botanical friends require care and feeding to grow and flourish. On October 1st, 1841, Marianne wrote a letter to her old governess, Maria Lewis. She wrote, Is not this a true autumn day? Just the still melancholy that I love, that makes life and nature harmonize. The birds are consulting about their migrations. The trees are putting on the hectic or the pallid hues of decay and begin to strew the ground that one's very footsteps may not disturb the repose of earth and air while they give us a scent that is a perfect anodyne to the restless spirit. Delicious autumn. My very soul is wedded to it, and if I were a bird, I would fly about the earth, seeking the successive autumns. Isn't that marvelous? Well, my favorite quotes from Marianne, or George Eliot, are all about her love of roses. She wrote, I think I am quite wicked with roses. I like to gather them and smell them until they have no scent left. And Eliot wrote this little poem about roses. You love the roses, so do I. I wish the sky would rain down roses as they rain from off the shaken bush. Why will it not? Then all the valleys would be pink and white and soft to tread on, They would fall as light as feathers, smelling sweet, and it would be like sleeping and yet waking all at once. Over the sea, queen, where we soon shall go, will it rain roses? This concept of raining roses was something Eliot wrote about several times. She loved that idea. And this last quote about roses is the one George Eliot is most famous for. It never rains roses. When we want more roses, we must plant more. And today is the birthday of the president and owner of Tulsa Greenhouse and Four State Wholesale, William B. Arnett, who was born on this day, December 22nd in 1928. The origins of Bill's Greenhouse date back to 1916, when it was founded by Gordon Vernon Voigt back in the early days of Tulsa. During the Depression, Bill's dad and a partner took over the retail nursery business started by Voigt, and they in turn developed it to include a wholesale operation. After learning the ropes from his dad, Bill officially took over the business in 1966. Bill and his wife Louise ran the business together. While they raised their four daughters, they oversaw five retail shops, three wholesale houses, and one growing facility. Now, the wholesale side of the business created exciting opportunities for Bill. And at one point, the Tulsa Greenhouse provided flowers for florists across four states. Bill enjoyed sharing his expertise with others And in addition to personally training florists, Bill influenced an entire generation of new designers by contributing to design schools every holiday season. A lover of fresh flowers, Bill prided himself on knowing every aspect of the business, including how to grow each of the flowers in his nursery. In his obituary, 
Bill's family recalled the time that Bill flew on the first jet airliner out of Tulsa. Now, this was no vacation. Bill had brought along a bouquet of fresh roses, and he wanted to see just how fast he could ship them across the country. He was a true floral businessman. At the time of Bill's death, he'd lost his wife, Louise, after being married to her for 60 years. He'd served as president of the Wholesale Florists and Florist Suppliers of America. He'd left a mark on the florist industry in the heart of the country, and he'd closed his business in 2005 after 90 years of operating in Tulsa. And I found out about Bill after reading his obituary online. And in his obituary, one of his daughters said something that I thought was such a beautiful quote and a wonderful tribute to what it was like to grow up with her dad. She said, we were surrounded by flowers all our lives. There were flowers galore. Ah. In Unearthed Words, today's words are from the peach and grape farmer and author David Moss Masumoto from his book, Epitaph for a Peach, from the section on pruning. My thoughts turn to the work of pruning. Ideally, the first blasts of winter have left their mark and stripped the trees of leaves. But I've seen antsy farmers prune while lots of leaves still hang in the tree. The work is slow and it's hard to see. I delay my pruning because for me, vision is crucial. The art of pruning involves seeing into the future. I can easily spot the dead branches by their dried, dark, almost black wood, but it's hard to envision new growth and the new shape the tree will take in two or three or four years from now. When I prune, I have to keep that vision in mind. Otherwise, I'll hesitate and grow timid and insecure as I gaze down the just worked row and see all the butchered trees and fallen limbs lying in the dirt. With each dead limb, there's hope for new growth. That's why I enjoy this part of pruning. I'm always working with the future. I'm like a bonsai gardener with my peach trees, shaping each tree for the long term. When working with dying trees, I feel one of the most important and strongest emotions a farmer has, a sense of hope. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, The Four Season Farm Gardener's Cookbook by Barbara Damroche and Elliot Coleman. This book came out in 2013 and the subtitle is From the Garden to the Table in 120 Recipes. In this book, America's most respected gardening couple, Barbara Damroche and Elliot Coleman, share what they've learned from growing and eating on their extraordinary four-season farm in Maine. This book shows you how to grow what you eat and how to cook what you grow. There's even a section for what to plant for a yearly cycle survival garden. Barbara and Elliot divide their book into two parts. The first half covers gardening, and the second part is devoted to the recipes. And I should mention that Barbara is also a master cook. This book is 496 pages of step-by-step -step instructions from America's Garden Royalty. It's a big book with an even greater value. Now, you can get a copy of the four-season Farm Gardener's Cookbook by Barbara Damroche and Elliot Coleman 
and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for around $3. That's a steal. Finally, here's something sweet to revive the little botanic spark in your heart. Today is the birthday of the American socialite and the first lady of the United States as the wife of the 36th president, Lyndon B. Johnson, and her name was Claudia Alta Taylor Johnson, but she always went by Lady Bird, and she was born on this day, December 22nd in 1912. On her 70th birthday, Lady Bird made her greatest contribution to American botany when she gave a financial endowment and a land grant of 60 acres to found the National Wildlife Research Center in Austin, Texas. Now, the center is a nonprofit that's dedicated to conservation and preservation, and it conducts scientific research on wildflowers and other native and naturalized plants. Together with Helen Hayes MacArthur, Lady Bird served as the co chair of the center. And for her philanthropy and love of nature, Lady Bird was awarded the American Horticultural Society's highest honor, the Liberty Hyde Bailey Award. And although her work as the First Lady had brought her incredible experiences, Lady Bird once wrote, My story begins long before that with a love of the land that started in my childhood. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. The Daily Gardener is produced in lovely Wyoming, Minnesota, with the help of Paige Mance, Brooke Beerbaum, Kiana Raley, Maddie Doyle, Natalie Decker, and Eric Begay. You can find The Daily Gardener on all your favorite social media. You can follow the show on Instagram, and listeners always have a standing invitation to join the free Facebook group for the show. Just search for Daily Gardener Community the next time you're on Facebook and request to join. All the stories and books that are featured on the show can be found over at thedailygardener.org, thedailygardener.org. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for my free Friday newsletter. Last but not least, you can share your own gardener greetings on the show by emailing me at jennifer at thedailygardener.org. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling, and as always, have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you tomorrow.